This weekend we were at the Let's Play Hockey Expo, joined by lots of fun guests, but now we're going to record the rest of our podcast here, and on it we're going to talk about Miko Koivu's big day, and what's your panic level with the Minnesota Wild? Of course, using Dean Evison memes to explain it. Before that, we're going to be joined by Matt Cook, talking about his history in the NHL and what he's up to now. As always, we're created by New Voice Studios, presented by Soda Stick, brought to you by Jim Beam and Better Edge. This is Season 3, Episode 116. Soda Stick is constantly releasing the best homage gear to Minnesota. Pay your respects to ODR with an association tee or hoodie, or snake any variety of palm beanies for the below zero temps. There's even a Bardown Beauties one for you to grab. Code Bardown Beauties always gets you 15% off all purchases at SodaStick.com. At Jim Beam, they know the importance of tradition, like chanting Let's Play Hockey prior to the start of each game, or playing the State of Hockey anthem after a wild win. This season, raise one to your fan family with the bourbon that invites us all to come as friends and leave as family. Jim Beam Bourbon Whiskey, the official bourbon whiskey partner of the Minnesota Wild and XL Energy Center. Remember, drink smart. Jim Beam Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume, copyright 2021, James B. Beam Distilling Company, Incorporate Claremont, Kentucky. From New Voice Studios. Oh yeah, you betcha. Let's go to the boat. Just combobulate <laughs> on the spot. Part of the Talk North Podcast Network. Fly out to Russia personally. <laughs> Jesse Pierce. This is off the rails. We're only a couple Already. minutes in. Alexis Pearson. We're not going to throw batteries on, on the ice at, you know, Kirill Kaprizov. This is, we're not that crazy. <laughs> like. Bar Down Beauty's Podcast. Was it about guys getting hammered down low night after night? No. It's like everyone loves to crap on analytics, but the analytics do not lie here. We are firing Fred at the top of the hour. More hit. It's like T. T. Starts now. Hello, everybody. What's going on? I'm Jesse Pierce. She's Alexis Pearson. Behind the camera, definitely not fired yet. Fred, producer Fred, joining us. Uh, we're at the Let's Play Hockey Expo. We've been there all day recording now segment one on Saturday, day two. Heck of a time out here. I absolutely have been loving it. A lot of work. People underestimate the amount of work. Oh, yeah. Is, right? Jesse, <laughs> Jesse and I got here this morning on Saturday, and you and I both had a long day yesterday on Friday. Oh, I worked yes. the Wild Game Friday night, so I went straight from that to straight from here to there. And you and I came back Saturday morning, and you and I looked at each other. We were like, we slept so good slept last so night. Good. Like, literally like a rock. I was up a half an hour before my alarm this morning and my yes. alarm was set pretty early that's yeah. how you know I slept good so exactly. it's a long day long weekend but it's a lot of fun and uh, it's it's been great to see all the people and be a part of the expo and uh, a big shout out to uh, Brian at Let's Play Hockey for, yes. for getting us here and everybody else involved uh, to allow us to participate because this is uh, one of the best parts of the year if you're a Minnesotan. So. Exactly you know it's been so fun not so fun for my Zephyrs boo mm -hmm. bummer but whatever it's fine the class A uh, championship starting right now so I'm not sure who the winner will be probably Hermantown <laughs> uh, but a matchup there with with War Road, so that's pretty fun. And then Andover Huskies versus the Maple Grove Crimson in double A. So I'll be curious to see what happens there. But, uh, you know, not a whole lot to talk about because we want to get right into Matt Cook, mm -hmm. um, our guest this week. Awesome guy. Very fun to check in, catch up with him. Um, but, you know, Alexis, let's talk a little bit about Minnesota Wild. Yeah. You know, Miko Koivu retirement happening tomorrow. Um, still some concerns, I think. Yeah, and we'll we'll get in uh, depth into it in segment three, but I think that the Minnesota Wild, um, they've obviously been playing a little bit better, and I think it was interesting because we talked to Kevin Gorg um, earlier today on Saturday, and he was saying that talking to some former players, they said that this time of year is actually one of the toughest stretches, just in general, like for, for any yeah. team, and especially the ones who are playing really good hockey over the season like the Wild have. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, is they've got a, a lot of teams around them right now that they're now battling for positions with for you know the playoffs like teams yeah. they were they were far clear ahead of earlier in the season and you thought right. there's no no chance in hell that any of these teams are going to catch the wild right. and now it's like okay well now we're close to the predators and we're close to the Dallas Stars and you've got a couple other teams in in uh, out of the playoff picture right now who could jump in at some mm -hmm. point um, I think Edmonton currently is the closest team into the playoffs who are not in there yet and we all know how good Edmonton can be. Uh, they um, don't have goaltending so they, you, know, you want to get on goaltending. We talk about bad goaltending. Edmonton <sighs> got some goaltending problems. They do. They've uh, historic. Poor can Connor you imagine? McDavid. Yeah, poor Connor Can't McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, somebody can, speaking of rescuing people, can we talk about the Jack Eichel thing real fast? Because oh, he always. he threw a lot of shade at Buffalo Sabres fans and I honestly... And didn't he say this is the most packed I've yes. seen? The, say the, uh, he USB? said this is the loudest I've heard this building and it only took seven 
seven years and me leaving for it to happen. I don't know what side I'm on because honestly, I love the shade thrown by Jack Eichel. And I don't think you hear hockey players talk like that that often. Like no. usually they're, they're very like, they're yeah. yeah. They, you know, we, we had Kucherov shirtless in a post game press conference chugging beers at the end of last season. So we're working our way up on the personality scale. Yes. Um, but you don't typically hear hockey players talk like that. A lot of times they'll just kind of like let it go. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of I'm kind of team Eichel it, just for the fact that Fair. he was brave enough to call out the fans. But I'm also kind of team fans just for the pure audacity of like you were so mad at him and now yeah. you're booing him. Like literally yeah. pick a side. No, so, well, and they literally bought tickets to that game to go boo him, right? Like, exactly. Like, we don't even care yeah. about this game. It's we the most packed that building you know has how, probably been in 10 years. We yeah. let you know how we feel. I mean, you know, we know how we feel about the Vegas Golden Knights. So yeah, too. we do. Go ahead, play Ooh, the Tampa Bay tomato, tomato. card, whatever. <laughs> Put them on eye or come yeah, on now. Mark who cares? Stone. We'll see you in the playoffs. Uh, I'm sure. Don't talk about it. Anyway, so. we're, like I said, we're not going to spend too much time on segment one today. Be sure to check out all of our social media channels with guests from the Let's Play Hockey Expo Kevin Gord, Michael Russo, Matt Dumba, Chris Stewart, Natalie uh, Darwitz. Natalie Darwitz, Karin Bai. The list goes on. Brandon Molesky. Egypt Ice Hockey. Yeah. Love it. Love, love, love it. Also, uh, shout out to Better Edge. You know the game. Bar, or Beat the Buttes every Tuesday against me. Thursdays against her. They also have a really cool uh, comp competition going on right now uh, for the Final Four mm -hmm. basketball. You could enter to win two tickets to Final Four basketball. That'll be sweet. You could take Alexis and I if you want, whoever wins it. Yeah, That'd be great. honestly, T. And they actually are doing college hockey betting now as well on their app. Love our Better Edge guys. Shout out to them. That's Better Edge. B-E-T-T-R Edge. Dot com code Buttes, B-A-U-T-S. Free 10 bucks to play against Alexis or I. Sodastick.com as well. Don't forget them. So we're going to take a quick break when we come back. Matt Cook, stay tuned. It's hockey season, baby. And the best way to head into a new season is to be fully equipped with all the merch you need to cheer on your favorite teams. Oh, and some Bard on Beauties merch too, right? Right. We've got you covered. Literally. Head over to teespring.com where you can find all kinds of custom design, Bard on Beauties apparel, plus so much more. Joining us now, everyone wants him on their team, but he's the guy you hated playing <laughs> against back in the day. Now a high school hockey coach, Mr. Matt Cook. Matt, what's going on? Not much, guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for joining us. I mean, tell us what are you what are you up to? I know Chaska, right? That's your new your new squad. How are things going at the helm of uh, the varsity boys team there in Chaska? Yeah, this is my first year back into high school coaching. Uh, first couple of years that I stepped away from you know the pro game, I jumped on staff with Mark Parrish at Orono um, and wow. tried my helm there. And, uh, needed to really just kind of decompress more, stepped away for a few more years, but opportunity this summer came up for me to take on the, the Chaska job and uh, something I've always wanted to do. Um, and I knew that I would get back into it. I just needed to um, make sure that I was caught up and, and total or, or whole on my family time. So, um, you know, with uh, our youngest being a senior in high school, um, it, it was time to start getting back involved and, the experience so far has been awesome. AKA you needed to get wife's approval before you decided to make another big commitment, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, it's something I'm not going to do uh, halfway. Um, if I'm making a decision to, to get involved, um, I want to give it everything I got just like I did my career. And, um, and so I needed to be, we need to be in a position from a family standpoint that we were ready to do that. You know, I always, I always find it interesting. There's, you know, you've got the professional athletes who go back into either coaching or management or, uh, you know, front office stuff at the pro level, but then you've got the people who come back and do it at the high school level, especially here in Minnesota, where high school hockey is such a big deal. Did you find it difficult to go from the intensity of the NHL to high school hockey? Not that high school hockey isn't intense, but was there a, a mental change you had to make there to adjust to the high school hockey style? Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, in Orono, it was really tough for me to deal with uh, because it was at such a different level and that hadn't been in my DNA for, you know, the first 38 years of my life. And so um, I think the break was good. Uh, I got some time to watch high school games and see how all of that goes and just really dive in fully uh, prepared and knowing and understanding what, um, not, not what the level, but what what was uh, acceptable and what I, what mm -hmm. I could, you know, expectations that I could set for, uh, you know, these 14 to 18 year old kids. What do you make of the tourney? Right. I mean, here in Minnesota, it's everything. What is uh, your uh, perception of, of it? Obviously you're hoping Chaska gets there. I know a big section semi game against Tonka tomorrow, but what do you make of how the state of hockey really embraces high school hockey here? 
I think it's a, I mean, obviously it's super unique. Um, you know, it's not the same in any other state. It's not the same in any other country. Um, and, you know, I grew up in a AAA and major junior world. So, um, you know, I was moving away from home at 16 to go play major junior. Um, so it's just, it's just a different model. Um, but that being said, I mean, you look at section two or double A right now, uh, you have Eden Prairie, Minnetonka, Chaska, and Prior Lake left. And all four teams could compete, um, mm -hmm. you know, with most junior teams. And so uh, it, the, the level doesn't sacrifice. Mm -hmm. How much did Parrish help you kind of ready yourself? Did you lean on him at all? Did he give you any tips or did he just kind of say, eh, good luck, <laughs> we'll see what happens? <laughs> I think uh, he leaned on me a little <laughs> more um, when I was in Orono. Um, and I think that's why he's into the media world now. Um, you know, uh, there was a funny moment in Orono our first year. Mark was trying to describe defensive zone play, completely botching it. And <laughs> I was just shaking my head and he's like, what? And I'm like, he's like, here, I didn't play in our own in any way. You do it, so. <laughs> I, I just took over the teaching of <laughs> defensive zone coverage, but uh, kind of a funny moment for the two of us. That's well, awesome. and before you got to, um, you know, this point in your hockey life, obviously you spent a long time in the NHL and uh, one of the teams that you spent some time with um, the Vancouver Canucks, obviously um, back. I, I always say, bring back the Northwest division. The Northwest division was like, I, I was, uh, you know, like 10, 11, 12 at the time when the Northwest division was, was around and starting to fade out. And I loved the rivalry between the Canucks and the wild. And there was some good Canucks teams back then. They seem to be kind of be going through a revamping here. They obviously brought Bruce Boudreau on uh, mid season. What do you think about this team now at this point in the season? And can I get a signature on the petition to bring back the Northwest division? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, when the divisions were there, you played each other so much. <laughs> yeah. It was impossible not to have rivalries. The problem with that was um, you just didn't see every team in the NHL. And so uh, I think that that hurt, you know, some markets not being able to play against the Toronto Maple Leafs or the Pittsburgh Penguins or the New York Rangers mm -hmm. in any certain year. And so change needed to happen. But, you know, I look back to those early 2000 years, um, you know, after the wild came in and our playoff series that we had against them mm -hmm. um, that we lost in seven games, but um, you know, they were heated, they were battled and uh, they, they were fun to be a part of. That's for sure. How often do you hear wild fans be like, man, I hated you when you played for <laughs> you were just like my, I mean, you got to get that every now and then, even when you tried to salvage a little bit of that. Playing for the wild. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think um, I've met anybody that said otherwise <laughs> here in Minnesota. So, you know, uh, some of my best friends that are, that are now when I first came when we first came here, you know, I, again, our son's playing baseball and his baseball coach asks dads to go out and help. It's the summertime. So I go and help like three weeks later. He comes up to me on the baseball field and he goes, only if you knew how much I hated you. And I was like. <laughs> You didn't even know me. Like, <laughs> you know, it's it's the fanatic part of the game. And it's true. Like, you know, you live and die by your team. And mm -hmm. um, it's hard for fans to s separate. Right. <laughs> it, it truly is. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, I, I understand what, you know, where the background is and what it's where it's coming from. And so uh, I, I enjoy those conversations like in these days <laughs> yeah now that you're away from it right like i am a good guy and i can get you that um you know yeah. it's interesting because we had talked to nate prosser a couple weeks ago right and it's so funny because nicest guy so unassuming <laughs> as like such a pest on the ice right did you separate that a little bit too like he said he kind of went into a complete blackout mode he was a different dude he didn't have a pseudo name or anything like that but were you the same way where you're very different off the ice than you were on or were you kind of like nah i was kind of all around the same type of guy as I was the player. No, I mean, it, it was early in my career that I was, I would even say groomed mm -hmm. to be the player that I became. Mm -hmm. um, I had to put myself in a position to prepare myself to go out and be that guy. That was my role. I accepted that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what was, that was, is what was going to lead to my success and ultimately led to the, my longevity of my career mm -hmm. was to bring value that others maybe necessarily weren't, you know, willing to or able to 
play that role. Mm -hmm. And it seems like nowadays uh, the game is changing quite a bit from those days of that enforcer role. And there's teams who don't even have what you might define as an enforcer anymore, and they can be good teams and survive without that. What do you think about the change um, in hockey where there's a lot of people who kind of reject that role altogether nowadays and say, I don't want it. I don't need it. Um, Do you think there still needs to be that guy on every team um, to play that kind of role? I mean, I got to correct you first because I definitely wasn't an enforcer. <laughs> I don't I don't deserve that label. I think I had 17 <laughs> fights or 20 fights in 17 in 17 years. So enforcer was not my my um, forte, um, you know, but I was a physical presence. Yeah, maybe, you know, creating some intimidation uh, and, and not in any other way other than like there's no space on the ice. So I'm right. going to get rid of the puck sooner. So, um, you know, I really took that, you know, I didn't care if you were a first line center or a fourth line winger, you know, I was going to be physical because that mm-hmm. was an element of my game. And ultimately as, you know, as the game um, transpired throughout my career, uh, you saw areas where the game got faster. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you went through a period of time where, now kids that had grew up with a stop sign on the back of their jerseys play the game different than people that did because now they they're taught if your back's turned you're mm-hmm. safe mm-hmm. and so the game has changed in today's world the game is played at such a high speed that physical play uh in reality brings so much risk that it's it's really hard um to be a, a consistent physical player mm-hmm. because of the risk of injury or suspension because the, in today's game, the onus is 100% on the hitter. Right. Um, and whereas, you know, back in the 80s, it wasn't that way. In the 90s, it wasn't that way. And, you know, you were taught you don't skate through the middle with your head down because <laughs> you're going to get railroaded, right? right. So um, now if you get hit in the head, it's the guy that's hitting you's fault. So, yeah. um, you know, the game has changed so much. And I don't, for me, it's not a better or worse thing. It's just where mm-hmm. the game has evolved to. And, um, it's played at such a higher pace. Yeah. Right. And you were, you know, for all intents and purposes, an offender of some of those shots, right. Where people looked at you and said, Oh, how could he do that? But I think you were really heralded for changing your game and trying to take the proper steps. I mean, talk a little bit about that and how you worked with Dan Blysma in Pittsburgh to really review and say, okay, how can I change my game? So I'm not that guy that's out there, you know, hurting a player. Cause of course, nobody ever wants to injure an opponent, you know, even in the sense of, of the game, talk a little bit about that aspect of your game as well. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, so I got to Pittsburgh in 2008 um, we won the cup that, that next spring. Um, and then over the next four years of being there, I had four suspensions, um, and some that I were, was a hundred percent wrong at, you know, I jumped at a guy or, you know, uh, and in those moments, like it's a timing issue and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I deserve it. Right. Like I, I tried to thrust to hit a guy too soon and, I end up leaving my feet before contact and that happened often, but if I was wrong, I was wrong, you know, and it wasn't until my last suspension, not my last one totally, but my last one in Pittsburgh um, against Ryan McDonough that like I'd gone through trying to change my game and trying to recognize scenarios or maybe that's not a good place to hit somebody, Mm -hmm. but in those moments you hesitate, which then leads to even worse results. Um, And so I was always taught to go out and get the biggest hit possible every moment and get him before he gets you type thing. And over the process of about three and a half years, I realized that the way that I mentally approached the game wasn't allowing me to be successful. And so I had to change how I processed the game and at the speed that I processed the game so that I could make different decisions in those moments. And, um, you know, spending hours and hours with Dan go and not, not my videos, but watching, other physical players, Ryan Callahan, you know, Dustin Brown and all Mm -hmm. of these guys watch them, you know, go out and play. And I, what I couldn't believe or what stood out more was not the bad hits, but like how, like a very minute detail timing or angle, if it's any, if it's just slightly off, it's an injury, it's a really bad hit. And so I need to get away from, eliminating those little factors mm-hmm. of, yeah. so that I could so that I could be successful 
Well, and let's talk about one of the uh, highlights of your career. Um, obviously winning the cup with Pittsburgh along some, some big names in hockey that, that people know and love, uh, maybe not Minnesota fans, um, but other fans, um, uh, most people, when they, when they win a cup, can't really put it into words. Um, is there any way you could try your best to describe what that, that moment was like? I mean, exhaustion is probably the first word that comes to mind. I mean, it's June 12th. It's 86 degrees in Detroit. Um, we've played 25, 26 extra games, um, you know, to end the season. And so uh, the wear and tear of playing for an extra two months um, every other night really takes its toll. And so, uh, I mean, I can remember, I mean, obviously, elation and excitement mm -hmm. and uh you know, just pure enjoyment in the moment. But then after you get back in the locker room and you're celebrating your buddies and then you're like, like, I'm exhausted. You know, like, <laughs> you know the cup, I remember it, like when I had my chance to skate with the cup on the ice, it's 35 pounds probably. Yeah. Felt like 135 pounds. I put, <laughs> over, I put it over my head and uh, almost dropped it backwards over top. Like I got scared and kind of just handed it back right away because, um, you know, you just, you don't even think about it. You don't have time to even go through those thoughts. But um, once you process a little, just you know, that shows up. But, you know, that, that group was special. We were in 10th in January. Um, and, you know, Utah brought up the Vancouver Canucks. We had a coaching change in, at the end of January and Dan didn't do much. He just kind of freed us up to play and everything was right. Timing was right. Mm -hmm. And we ended up hitting the playoffs on a high. So, I mean, sometimes a coaching change can do that. And I think that Bruce is a, is a positive and, you know, he's a player's coach. Mm -hmm. um, he's very positive with his players. He was an offensive player. And so he thinks that his approach is that because I had Bruce in Washington for a really short stint, but um, you know, he, he's really upbeat with the guys. And I think that that, you know, his presence in that locker room has really sprung them on to, um, you know, really turn it around and want to go out on the ice and do well for the coach. Well, and what, what is that like to go through that mid-season coaching change? Because obviously if there's a mid-season coaching change, things are not going well. And I'm sure there's that balance of wanting to be optimistic. You can turn it around, but the frustration and fear of that change, what is that like to, to go through that, those first phases with the new coach and knowing there's still time to salvage the season and, and hoping you can do so? I think you go through a, a bit of a roller coaster because, you know, instantly when you find out the coach is fired i mean mo for the most part some guys are happy some guys aren't <laughs> because he's got his favorites right but um i think you 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 instantly feel some sort of responsibility i mean if you have any cooth at all as a player like he didn't get fired because of him he got fired because of me and so you mm -hmm. go through that in the beginning and then once you're able to process that then it's you know there's maybe some excitement because we're getting a fresh start but then how does this coach view me? So then you create some anxiety and doubt on, well, I got to go out. It's usually why you see a really good response when there's a coaching change mm -hmm. um, and someone new is coming in because players feel like they got to go out and you only get one chance to make a first impression. <laughs> they got to go out and make that good impression. So you usually see teams win early in coaching changes. And then I usually say they take a 10 or 20 game window. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's the effect that the coach can have on a group. Are you saying Bruce, there it is with the rest of the uh, Canucks nation. Have you heard that? I have not. No. That's what they, for some reason, they're yeah. all up with, you know, like the song, Bruce like, whoop, there, there it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even Michael Buble was doing it at the game the other night. I saw he was in attendance. Yeah. <laughs> cool. That's too. Yeah. Something, something funny. What was it that made you decide uh, to sign with the Minnesota wild then after, as your contract was expiring in Pittsburgh, what about that squad that year was kind of like, yep, let's go do this. What uh, yielded that decision? Yeah, we had negotiated with the penguins you know, from probably from three quarters of the way through the season on, um, I, we had a, you know, a, a, an agreement on a deal that we would get to. Um, and that was the first year of like opening up the window before you could actually sign. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I got a phone call from an ex assistant coach in, Pit in Pittsburgh, um, that we won, that won the cup with us. And he, expressed his interest and said he needed me and needed to be able to create change with the group that was here. And, um, 
you know, sometimes, you know, the, the, there's relationships there that are strong. And uh, Mike and I had a strong relationship and, you know, we built that in Pittsburgh. And so um, I trusted and believed that this was the right next move. And unfortunately it didn't end well. And I got bought out after two years, but, um, you know, at the time, you know, this was the right move. Well, and you played in uh, a couple different, like significant places for different reasons. You got your time in Canada where hockey is obviously loved and you had your time with Pittsburgh where you won a championship with, with some, you know, other really great talent on that team. And you spent some time in Minnesota where kind of like Canada, we adore our hockey here. Is there, was there one stint or another that stood out for, for a reason aside of like the actual game of hockey, but just the way the, the place that you played in, is there a certain city that stands out to you the most? I mean, I would say they all stand out and for different reasons. And, you know, Vancouver, I mean, you, you take fan to fanatic and uh, Canadian city um, lives and dies by their hockey. And a trip to the grocery store was two hours. <laughs> uh, and, that, and you knew that. So that that was the case. Um, but the community really at the time when for the most part, when when I was there, the community embraced us and um really, really supported the team. Uh, when I went to Pittsburgh, they were on the rise. Uh, they'd mm -hmm. lost in the finals to Detroit the year before. But I think the biggest thing that stands out there is that it's a really, um, really respectful city um, in that they're very hardworking, very blue collar, um, very down to earth and uh, understand and respect what a professional athlete needs, goes through and deals with. And mm -hmm. so any fan interaction was probably the best out of any of the cities in Pittsburgh, just because of, uh, and I heard a, you know, a, a, a wise a, a tale or a story that, uh, you know, the black curtain, you know, they, they pretty much set the standard with how you treat your athletes. And outside mm -hmm. of that, you know, the city of Pittsburgh just embraced that and, and followed it through. Um, obviously winning there um, mm -hmm. <laughs> creates a different memory. And so that, that's why, you know, Pittsburgh's super special to me. Um, but in Minnesota, um, there is a lot of knowledge about hockey. But again, um, they do everything in their power to try and support the team and follow the team. And so um, I think that is the same in each three cities. Like, mm -hmm. they, it, it's different, and they all go about it their own way. But each each place really embraced their, their hockey team and um, supported it. Well, before we let you go, I do want to touch on one more thing that you're currently doing, your current role with TPH here. I mean, you're really embracing hockey as a community and helping um, develop students and athletes as more than just hockey players, but as people. Tell us a little bit about your role with TPH and um, what brought you to get involved with them. Yeah, so uh, TPH is short for Total Package Hockey. Um, they've been in existence since 2001, um, but really running centers of excellence, which is what we are here in Plymouth. Uh, since 2014. Um, we're the 15th location nationally. Um, so there's one in Nashville, one in Scottsdale, two in Florida, a, a couple in Michigan, uh, two in Colorado. I mean, just kind of, you know, one in uh, Indianapolis. So we're just slowly one in Chicago before I forget anybody. <laughs> at me. But, um, you know, we believe that there's a holistic approach to academics and sport. And so um, our student athletes come, uh, they do an hour of on ice and an hour of off ice every day and four hours of academics. Um, the cool thing about it and what the reason why I got involved is I really believe that academics doesn't need to sacrifice because you chase, you know, being elite in your sport. And so, and I think that um, in 2014, TPH was a bit of ahead of their time. But now they're hitting the market. They're, in, they're already establishing a market where people are searching other options for academics. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I have, I have a high schooler uh, and during distance learning, you know, an hour and a half and they're done school. Yeah. Um, and so why would they go spend seven and a half hours and then have an hour and a half of homework when they can get it all done in an hour and a half? And so, um, you know, our, our, our model just is a real holistic approach at, um, you know, really helping student athletes pursue being great at academics and athletics. And um, we're real close to uh, announcing a second location here in the cities. 
Um, and when that location opens up, we'll have baseball and softball with us as well. Um, so we are, hockey is our bread and butter, um, but really feel that this model is lending itself to all athletes that want to pursue, you know, the next level or college or pro level sport uh, athletics. Scottsdale, Florida, but you chose the Minnesota selection. <laughs> Fun, sir. Well, it, so it's somewhat, somewhat funny. Uh, um, last year going through, um, you know, the, the process and they were, they had announced Chicago and Fort Lauderdale and I was ha- going to have the choice of either one of those two. And at the last minute they announced that they were going to open it. So, uh, I was like, I don't have to move. I can stay with my family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This, this is the right fit. Now <laughs> when it's negative four out, I'm like, why I, remind me again? Why I'm yeah. Right. Um, you know, uh, the quality of athletes, I mean, we, You know, in year one, we're here in Plymouth, we have 20 student athletes. And so um, we'll we'll grow at the pace that we need to grow. And um, it's been a great learning experience for me from, uh, you know, learning the business side of things and um, really helping uh, all of these kids. I I really enjoy the mentorship part of this, Um, you know, being on site with them every day and um, helping kids understand, you know, a, what it takes, but B, also how, how we should carry ourselves and how we should act and coexist with, with others that maybe we don't really get along with. Right. Well, perfect. Well, Matt, thank you again so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to chit chat with us. Love seeing you around. We'll make sure people say nice things and don't <laughs> come at you. Yeah, be nice, wild there. fans. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, guys, this is producer Fred. I just wanted to ask everyone to go out there and spread the word about Bar Down Beauties. Leave us a like, share, thumbs up, review, you name it, we want to hear from you. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, your favorite podcast app. Thanks again to Matt Cook for joining us. I kind of wish that Chaska would have made it. Yeah. Just for the fact that that really would have teed it up nicely. Yeah. You and know? you could tell, I mean, it's funny because it's like you think of these guys as these former players or these girls, these former players, and like how much he loves being involved at the high school level. It's yeah. like that's just as cool to him as some of the other stuff he's done in his career. And you could really tell the passion he has for helping grow these athletes. And so, yeah, too bad they couldn't make it to the tournament. Um, but really excited for Matt and, and hoping for the best for his team next year. Exactly. And Shout out to LinkedIn for being the way yeah. that I was able to connect with Matt Cook and Nate Prosser. Yeah, l- who yeah. thought that getting guests for your hockey podcast would be through LinkedIn? Because <laughs> Link- uh, this is our career. This is honestly, this is our career now, yeah. Guess, right? So shout out LinkedIn. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> As a reminder, we are at the Let's Play Hockey Expo. Sick background. We know it. We wish we could keep it. We're working on it. Yeah, we, we might steal it from LinkedIn. We might, <laughs> we might be here every week. We'll see. We'll find out. Um, but yeah, so up for debate. Yep. Let's go. Are we hitting the panic button? Are Basically we the is what we did with a bunch <laughs> yes. of different Dean Evans and faces. It was a very unique up for debate, but I was kind of in a, I was in a cranky mood. I'm like, you know what? I don't want to like get all soppy and talk about like how mad I am about the wild losing. So yeah. I'm going to make this yeah. funny and try to get people to laugh. So Fair. I put out the tweet saying, um, you, you know, are you hitting the panic button? What's your panic level with the wild? And use Dean Evison facial expressions to explain it. Yeah. And uh, the first one was Dean Evison screaming. And I said, uh, hit the panic button, call 911. The second yeah. one was Dean Evison um, looking like he was just like dead inside. And I said the, that option was I feel nothing. Right. And then the third option was a calm, cool and collected Dean Evison. And I said, not worried. I'm confident they'll be OK. Um, and actually, every single person who interacted with that tweet voted that they were comfortable and confident the wild would turn things around wow. jesse i'll let you go first though you always give me the floor it's your turn now what is your panic level with the wild they're obviously we're recording this on saturday so the only game happening in between now and the release is going to be the predators game they're coming off um a possible three or four points on a back-to-back game mm-hmm. road trip where yep. are you sitting right now jesse i mean it was a bad road trip i'm not gonna lie even though you got the win on Thursday was not a good road trip. It's just it simple as simple as that. I mean, not because they lost in Columbus either. Mm-hmm. Just it, it, things didn't look right. However, I am not hitting the panic button. I'm I'm somewhere in the middle, right? Like I, as as you guys have all known and as I have predicted, the goaltending situation continues to be a yeah. concern. Um, and Nashville's a tough team. Yeah. Like I'm I you know again I know we'll know the outcome by the time this is released, but I think that Nashville game will really be very telling as to really how I feel like. If Nashville absolutely beats up on the Wild, 
then maybe hit the panic and kind of like temper back your expectations for mm-hmm. this squad because you're going to have to go through teams like Nashville. We had Ryan Carter on during the mm-hmm. Let's Play Hockey Expo event, and he was talking about how Nashville has just got everything, that grittiness, that, that score. I mean, they're, you know, they're a tough team, and Minnesota struggles against very – gritty tough squad so I mean because they've come a game the Wilds game has become speed and so now their game used to be more like that where they're like okay we'll wear you down we're gonna defend hard we're gonna win a two to one game yeah now they're like no we want to get out there and score five goals and if you stop us from doing that we don't have a backup plan so I I think that's a really good point Jesse that I I think that those teams have caused them more issues Mm -hmm. recently than former Wild teams because they're not used to having to play that game of hockey anymore because they've got more skill and not to say those teams don't have skill but it's just a very different uh, kind of game when you play that way. So, yeah. so you're somewhere in between. You're I'm somewhere in between. Okay. I mean, because I don't think – I mean, I think the problem is Minnesota has proven to be a very resilient team. Right. right? Like, they will get out of it. They will come back. They will win. They'll pull their goalie with nine minutes. They don't care about your goalies. <laughs> like, we will <laughs> they do. Can we talk about that for way? just a second? <laughs> Dean Evison does not care about anybody's Ooh. feelings because – and listen, when Patrick Waugh did it back in the day, I thought yeah. it was hilarious because I'm like, yeah. give me all of the chaos. I don't care if they score seven empty net goals. Right. Now Dean does it. I'm sitting at home biting my fingernails on the verge of tears because I'm like, please, Psychotic. please do not like, – give up all these empty net goals how do you feel about that are you pro pull the goalie with half a period ago (laughs) which is funny because i feel like it should be that's more your i know right like the chaos pro chaos but i I hate this for some reason you know what the only reason i hate it r.i.p my stories because i I have to rewrite my entire story every single time and i do it for the sake of you fans because usually i write the story early because that's proven to be a reverse jinx <laughs> and Minnesota comes She's back. She's the person wins. of the people. Person for the people. Um, yeah, so I'm, I am. I'm somewhere in between. Okay. Are you hitting the panic button? I feel so, like you're a person that would hit the panic button. You know. Uh, are we still a wagon? I saw you tweet that we're yes still a Yes and no, we are still a wagon confirmed. Okay. Um, but so the thing is, is when it comes to sports, I'm like uber optimistic and I always believe like the best will happen. And I always think like, you know, when things are going bad, they'll get out of it. It'll be fine. If they're, you know, losing a game, they can come back yeah. and win. If they're on a losing streak, they'll turn it around. So I tend to not be a panicker when it comes to sports and Minnesota sports people are like known to be panickers they yes. Minnesota sports fans love to panic it is their mo to panic they don't know any other way they don't know any don't other, know way. other way and I don't blame them I get it you guys have been through a lot um and I don't blame you I mean um, you older people <laughs> you not older people, people. Your, yeah not exactly. us young ones I'm not, yeah, I've, um, seen <laughs> I've seen some things yeah I'll get there eventually <laughs> um I would say I'm probably somewhere in between like you but leaning more towards not being worried and to be honest, there's been days through this stretch where I have been so stressed out because it, and it's just, we don't get a reprieve. It's just, there's a game after game. I don't even have a, t- a chance to like not be sad for a day because I'm like, they play sure. again tonight and they might lose again tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, but honestly, talking to some of the guys and girls that we talked to this weekend at the Let's Play Hockey Expo made me feel a little bit better about the situation. We talked to Ryan Carter, we talked to Kevin Gorg and Michael Russo and they they brought Matt up Dumba. the same, and Matt Dumba. Matt Dumba was here for the boys. He was, he was here for the boys. boys. The boys are getting up, he said. So just stay tuned for that. The boys are getting (laughs) up. Um, And, you know, they were saying how this stretch of games where I think the Wild on Sunday will be game 58 of the season, if I'm remembering correctly, but they said game 40 through game 60 is the toughest stretch of time for uh, players in an NHL season. Just because you, you're out of the, the lust of the new season, you are getting into the phase where things are tightening up in the standings, points matter a lot more, you might be dealing with injuries at this point if you haven't already, mm-hmm. um, if you're not in the playoffs, you're battling to get into it, if you're in the playoffs, you're battling to stay stay in it and it's just a lot it's it's a it's a grind um and so hearing that made me feel a little bit better that like okay this is this is a thing you know a lot of teams go through this and Mm -hmm. that's what I always remind myself when things are going poorly for teams I'm rooting for is that every team goes through that at some point and I just hope that the team can find a way to get out of it this homestand that the wild are gonna are gonna have coming up here starting with that Nashville game on Sunday is going to be huge to see can you get some points out of some good teams that are going to be coming to the XL Energy Center um, in this homestand? Yeah. So that's going to really determine a lot. And then after that, there's only a month left. So uh, it's going to be make or break Woo! time. Yeah. Let's go. That's going to do it for this week's episode. Again, thank you to Matt Cook for joining us on our guest spot. Shout out to Let's Play Hockey for allowing us to come hang out. Uh, shoot some shit with some people. It was a yeah, good time. It was fun. Yeah. yeah. Got a little off the wheel, off the way. We wheel always do. You know, Are we ever happens. on? We're never on the rails. It happens. Yeah. As always, thank you to Talk North for featuring us on their lovely network, sodastick.com. Code bar down abuse will get you 15% off all your purchases. Don't forget to play Beat the Butte Against Me Tuesdays, Thursdays against Alexis. That's on Better Edge, B E T 2 R Edge. 
Buttes.com. Uh, code Buttes will get you a free $10. And thank you to all of you. We did it, by the way. I don't know that we have announced it. 1,000 subscribers. subscribers on YouTube. Woo-hoo. Yay. Woo, the crowd is going wild <laughs> in the back. They love it. They're doing oh, the, they're wave. the wave. They're yes, starting the wave. Go. This is beautiful. So you guys all rock. Seriously, couldn't do <laughs> I am going to kick my cousin out of here. We got to go. We're going to wrap. Have a great rest of your week. We'll see you next week.